As y'all have heard me say before, the most important part of planning any adventure are the snacks. And if you're looking for a delicious and nutritious snack that packs a real protein punch, crack into a good source of protein with tasty, healthy, wonderful pistachios. Each one ounce serving of wonderful pistachios contains six grams of protein giving you over 10% of your daily value in that one serving. It's one of the highest protein nuts out there. And that's not all. Pistachios are also known for the fiber and better for you unsaturated fats, which may help keep you feeling fuller longer. Best part, wonderful pistachios come in a variety of flavors and sizes. Perfect for enjoying with your family and friends or taking them with you on your summer adventures for those snacks we're talking about. So whether you're dropping off the kiddos or running between meetings or about to climb a mountain, fuel up with a healthy and tasty snack. Wonderful Pistachios will be your new go-to. You can check them out at wonderfulpistachios.com and learn more about how these little green wonders can power up your day. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Today we're throwing it back all the way back to episode 200 back in 2016, and it's a Throwback Thursday episode, of course. Kurt is the host at the time, and we're talking about scuba diving and adventure travel through scuba. And, you know, I, I'm from Florida. I was when I when I took over this show, I was living out in Colorado. That's where the show was born and raised, as I like to say. Um, but it has since moved back to Florida with me. And as you know, there's a lot of water here. And our planet itself is surrounded by water. Basically, two-thirds of the world is covered in water. And I just went to the aquarium here in Tampa or near near us in Tampa. And it just, it's such an amazing place. The water, it's just, we think of it as, at least me, as this horizon of blue or just, you know, this impenetrable kind of medium unlike the mountains that you can like go explore to me when I see mountains I'm like I can I can walk over there I can go over there and there's all this stuff in between and almost wrongly don't make that same assumption about the ocean uh, or about all you know water in general until I do go snorkeling or uh, kind of peer into that other side of the water with something like goggles. You know, those things that allow us to access it open up this world. And I'm falling more and more in love with, with water. And, and I, I need it now. I didn't realize how much I needed it when we were out west. But water is just fa- fantastic. So I've almost kept scuba diving at arm's length because I'm afraid of how addicting it seems. It's kind of like climbing. Anybody you know that's like really into climbing, it's like a drug. They just sell everything. They're all in all the time. The whole dirtbag culture, it's a real thing. And it almost seems like it's out of their control. <laughs> and I, it seems like that with scuba divers too, the people I know that, that scuba. It's almost like spacewalking. You just can't understand it until you do it. You're just in this suit, breathing this air. You can't hear anything. You're transported into a different dimension, it seems like, is what they describe it. And so I don't know. I'm afraid that it's going to just capture me and never let me go. And then all that's where all my money and time goes from here on out. Anyway, I'm going to I'm going to dive in a little bit more, no pun intended with this episode. I can't wait to hear it. I've actually never heard this episode and uh, I'm excited. Uh pun intended. Let's dive in. Today is all about scuba diving, and we have not done a scuba show for a long time, so I'm really excited. I don't know if any of you know, but I'm actually a scuba diver, and I have Scott Taylor with us, who is scuba diver extraordinaire. So Scott grew up in Colorado, and his father-in-law ran a scuba shop. So Scott became a physical therapist. He spent four years in the Air Force. And he started diving in 1970, and in 1984, he took over the scuba business full-time, and he is the owner-operator of A1 Scuba and Travel Aquatics Center, and I'll let him explain the the title there because it's kind of interesting. They have certified 
thousands of people to scuba dive. And so Scott is here to tell us about scuba, about adventure travel, and Scott, welcome to the program. Well, thanks, Kurt. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Oh, you bet, man. This is going to be fun. We started talking before I pressed record here and almost did a full show just because we're having so much fun chatting about this. And so now we get to redo everything we just said. Cool. That'd be fun. <laughs> You're making so, me sound old, though. You gave a lot of dates out there. So if anybody's a mathematician, well, I am old. What can I say? Well, you're kind of like me. We're celebrating multiples of our 30th. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, uh, incremental multiples, not 30 that's, multiples. But that's, there you go. we'll move on. So, Scott, why scuba? Why did you start diving, and why do you work in scuba full-time? All right, well, thanks. I, um, I, I want to tie it into my interest in working with people with disabilities. As it ends up, when I got into scuba diving, I... Uh, was also volunteering in high school with a handicapped swimming program and got into the scuba and I immediately thought how much fun this would be with for people with disabilities. So fast forward a few years after I get, when I was in the military, I did some volunteer work with some uh, handicapped swim programs. Went to college, as you said, became a physical therapist and it wasn't long after I graduated that I talked to my father-in-law and said, you know, I'd like to take some of my patients in the pool on scuba, I think this would be kind of cool. Get them out of their wheelchair and cr off crutches, braces, or prosthetic devices, and let's give it a try. And and it was an overnight hit. And what I, you and I kind of talked about it before the show started. What I quickly discovered is that diving, scuba diving in particular, is uh, it's the great equalizer. It puts people in a medium that all but eliminates gravity and so now you can discard all of those items I talked about earlier gravity which was restrictive out of the water is absent in the water and now you can start moving body parts that you might not have moved very well or at all out of the water and you can propel from point A to point B without the restrictions of a device and that for me was just this huge epiphany and so once I started doing that Kurt, I thought this is what I got to do. I'm, uh, I think I was born to be a bubblehead. So, '84, I hung up sorta my physical therapy hat and put on my scuba fins, and I've been doing it full time ever since. Hmm, that's cool. So you work with Craig Hospital here in Colorado to continue giving people with uh, physical challenges an opportunity to try scuba and find out what it's all about. I do. Um, that's where I last worked as a PT and uh, happily left in good, ter in good terms, didn't get a pink slip, and uh, started bringing patients from Craig to our dive store. We're kind of lucky we have an indoor pool, so started bringing them to our store. Uh, it's evolved now, many years later, to a monthly program where uh, patients, whether inpatients or maybe they're here for a reevaluation or a first-time evaluation from out of state, are given an opportunity to try a variety of activities. And uh, Craig has this incredible therapeutic rec department where they introduce, you can pick an activity you probably have talked about on the show uh, in the past. They select these activities, give people the opportunity. Ours happens to be scuba. They have the transportation made available, bring patients over to our store. Uh, we're quite lucky, we have a large building and we have a two-level building, so we installed an elevator. Uh, people wheel in, and immediately they're in an environment where our staff is friendly and greets them, and they've they've experienced some of these things through various in-services themselves. So it's a warm and friendly environment. They come with peers, uh, other people with disabilities, some of the staff members from Craig. Get on the elevator, go downstairs, and then they, they head to our pool. So we're able to uh, take them into a water environment in a, in a really fun way. We have, I mentioned to you earlier, we have a lift over our pool that Craig donated, had installed and donated, so we can get people out of their wheelchairs or into the water uh, quite, quite easy. And then from there, we do a Discover Scuba, just like we would anywhere around the country, people do Discover Scuba Diving experiences. We have a staff who volunteers their time. These are phenomenal people who've had some training. They're scuba divers themselves, and we get these folks in the water and we, the only intent we have is to give people an experience. And hopefully through this experience, it gives them an attitude of enablement where 
started out saying I can't. Suddenly you you did what? You went you went scuba diving? Are you kidding me? And they had fun. All as I mentioned earlier, that we've eliminated gravity. They do an activity, get out of the water, and I'll tell you the smiles are are just priceless. And I think a lot of people have stretch marks from smiling so much <laughs> after, their, after their experience. And and whether or not somebody goes on to become a certified diver at that point or not is is really not our intent. It's our intent to, as I said change an attitude. I can now as opposed to I can't. And you know, I could ramble on forever about the, the testimonials and the stories of people who have just had nothing but positive accolades about their experience. And it's kind of a new mindset, new attitude change. And again, I have to give Craig so much uh, credit um, for providing that opportunity, whether it's scuba or other experiences. And we just feel very fortunate to be a part of that whole process. You know, what I love about what you were just telling us there, Scott, is how people go from an attitude of I can't to I just did that. Yeah. And uh, when someone has suffered some sort of a traumatic injury, it's real easy to get stuck in that I can't world. And, you know, we mentioned Matt Feeney to each other earlier yeah. and Adaptive Adventures and how they take people and say, look, you can. Absolutely. And yeah. when when people with any sort of a physical challenge find out that there are devices, there are mobilities, there are ways to do everything now. If you want to do it, you can do it. And I love it because you're you're waking people up to that. Well, there's so many great groups of people in our country and beyond who really want to get people motivated and encourage them. I have a, a friend in Mexico, Leo Morales, and Leo lost his leg to cancer about uh, six or seven years ago now. And Leo was extremely depressed, was ready to sort of end things, and through a friend, through his brother actually, he got into scuba diving. And I'll tell you what, Kurt, it changed his life. He is now mm. the record holder for deep diving in the country of Mexico, somebody with a disability. He and I and, and a few other people, Missy Franklin and a couple other folks, we were involved with a documentary uh, about diving and the enabling part of diving. It's called The Current. Uh, Kurt Miller is the director of the Warren Miller film family. And uh, I'll tell you what, Leo, just to hear him talk about diving and what it's done for him, uh, as a veteran, I'm quite fortunate. I have worked with a number of veterans, as we both know, as we all know, uh, PTSD, combat PTSD is terrible. And there's been suggestions of, you know, multiple suicides done daily. 22, mm. I'm hearing a day, and that, that could be simply rumor, but there's there's a lot of need for therapies out there. And there's a number of groups in our country who are taking veterans with PTSD and getting them into scuba. Uh, there's a group called Waves, for example, out on the West Coast here in, Calif in California who are taking veterans now and changing their lives, changing their sure. attitudes through scuba of all crazy things. So, yeah, sorry, I'm rambling, but I think there's so, it's a great recreational activity. It's a very therapeutic, exciting adventure activity, too. You know what's funny about that, Scott? We used to almost always ask the question at the end of our show, so what good is it? What are you doing for the planet? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And you answered it first. And really, it's amazing to, to find out with almost any adventure sport, the benefits that are available to people that get involved with it and the way that the sport can be used to challenge people, to draw people out, to give them a new perspective. Let's talk about perspective. There's one for you. Scuba sure. diving is a completely different perspective. What is it like to be under the water? Well, little <laughs> curve. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's you know, I've already sort of given you the whole freedom sp spiel, but I think to see the stuff, I mean, when I've been within inches of whale sharks, wow. massive critters underwater, I've, I've dove with many, many sharks, still have all my appendages, all my toes, etc. cetera. I, I feel blessed to see these and little tiny critters too. I've traveled from many countries across the, the earth uh, to just go scuba diving. So the colors, the the critters that you see, it's mind-boggling. Again, dating myself, I'm kind of the old Jacques Cousteau era guy. He's who 
he's who really got me going, the underwater world of Jacques Cousteau. I'm sure some of the listeners can can relate to that. Or Mike Nelson in Sea Hunt. I mean, I was I was one of those. I love those all the knife fights and the spear gun stuff. We don't do that, but I thought it was kind of cool at the time. And the James Bond movies always have those cool dive scenes. I think it's just this underwater adventure where we're not talking, we're, we're hearing, we're seeing, we're doing, we're, we're experiencing something that, you know, 75% of our planet's water. And to be able to go underwater and encounter that is a, what a privilege that is. Oh, yeah. I couldn't agree more. You know, we were joking about how much scuba has changed. And Scott, I want to tell the story that I told you I was going to tell. I've told it on the show once before, but it's worth telling twice. And then you can tell everybody how it's not like that. Sure. (laughs) Can't wait. So I learned to dive from a buddy who was an avid diver years ago. And he was old school. He learned Navy SEAL methods. And that was pretty hardcore. But I, I went through all the manuals. He orally tested me on it. He put some scuba gear on me and said, let's go. And we went down to 70 feet, and I had 120 cubes cubic feet of air on my back, which is more than a sport diver would normally carry. But I uh, we went down to 70 feet, and I sucked a full 120 cubes down <laughs> and ran out of air on my first dive <laughs> at 70 feet and then had to do a free ascent. And so, and that was in kind of a dark, murky lake. I mean, it was, it was an amazing experience and I I had a ton of fun doing it, but that's not the way it's taught these days. No, hallelujah. I mean, (laughs) uh, you know, you're right. Back when I learned in the late sixties, when I started, it was all hairy chested guys. And, you know, it was like Henry Ford. What, what color, you can have any color piece of equipment you want, as long as it's black. (laughs) Right. So it was all that black, heavy bulky dive gear, and it was a, a sport that evolved from the military. It was the Navy SEALs out there. It was all those you know, wartime activities. And then all of a sudden, we started seeing this as a, a recreational activity. And of course, when that happens, you got to change your procedure. So when I learned, I mean, it was ripping gear off and turning your air off and spinning you underwater. Any sort of a, it wasn't a, let's see if we can get somebody to pass. It's, it was failure. It's how can we weed them out? Right. Once again, kind of that military mentality. And God, thank God it, it changed because even though I loved it, I mean, I was 17. So I was all about that harassment stuff, but by today's <laughs> standards, you know, you want your kids to die. We spoke about that. Kids don't want that. People don't want that kind of harassment. They want a, a family or a, an individual activity they can enjoy. So it has really evolved to a, a very, I don't want it to sound sedentary either, because I think there's a lot of excitement to scuba, but now it's methodical. And so you, you learn about diving. It, it, I call it a three-step process. So first step is you learn about the activity through some media, whether it's buying a book or, or through an online e-learning process. Uh, we're a PADI, P-A-D-I, Professional Association of Diving Instructors facility. And PADI's the biggest in the world training organization. But to learn to dive, you have to be, it's like driving a car. You have to be licensed. So you go through this process of learning about it, as I said, step one, the media, and that takes you know as much time as you want. You can put it, take your iPad with you. You can take any device, your iPhone, and download this program and, and read it and study it and take some quizzes online. And then the next step is to come to a dive center, in our case, and we have a pool. So you have a Sometime in the classroom, reviewing concepts, not reteaching everything. I I almost hate to use the word classroom. It's knowledge development. (laughs) So we we develop some knowledge or enhance it a little bit, try to make it fun. And then we get in the pool. And then we do a bunch of skills in the pool. And you and I talked about earlier, a lot of from assembling the equipment to some what if skills. What, What if I got water in my mask? Or what if I was smiling so big at that critter that my regulator dropped out of my mouth? How do I put it back in and clear the water? How do I adjust things underwater? What if your situation, we actually talk about what if you didn't monitor your pressure gauge, like a gas gauge on a car, and you ran out of air or gas, what would you do? We go through a, some exercises on at least letting you feel what that experience is like underwater. We let you know, we don't surprise you. We're going to turn your air off, look at your pressure gauge, 
watch the air diminish, feel what it's like for it to run out, signal to your buddy that you're now out of air using a, a hand signal, and a good hand signal, not a nasty one. And then <laughs> you'll share you'll share air using one of a couple of different techniques. So we a lot of the what if stuff is in the pool through two, three, or four pool sessions, and then you apply all that stuff in the third step, during the third step. And the third step is to go to an open water site. And that could be a lake in our case, or a quarry. Uh, we have a wonderful downtown, Denver downtown aquarium what we partnered with, and I can talk more about that later and get you started. Uh, or you go to the ocean. And, and so now you do a four open water scuba dives where you repeat many of the skills learned in the pool over four separate dives. And once done, uh, you are there then a certified diver. So some paperwork is done and you celebrate, jump up and down. And, and now, unlike a driver's license where you have to have it renewed, now your diver's license is good for life. So that's, that's sort of the process, um, if I may, uh, that, that could take as long as you want it to. Back when I learned, it was weeks. Oh, my God. Well, we all know that life passes us by if you do anything for too long anymore. It's just too many demands. So we have a, a weekend program. You can study at home, as I already said. We can get you in the pool over the weekend a few times. We can even start your open water dives at the downtown aquarium. So that's very popular. Or traditionally, there's week evenings where you go three or four nights during the week to learn. So it, it isn't the week's that some people might think it can be a matter of, of days, quite honestly. Mm. Well, that's fun. It is cool. So you mentioned the aquarium, and I'm glad you said it twice. The first time you said aquarium, the sound yeah. cut out for just a second. Oh. So oh. I want to emphasize that A1 Scuba gets to dive in Denver's aquarium. Pretty cool. <laughs> that is awesome. Isn't that neat? Isn't that neat? I have got to tell you... Uh, Downtown Aquarium is, the Denver Downtown Aquarium is owned by Landry's Corporation, and I'm sure people have heard names like the Chart House and uh, various steakhouses and, and uh, the Rainforest Cafe and et cetera. Well, there's some 300 restaurants owned by Landry's. They also own about five aquariums, one in Las Vegas and a few others. The Denver Aquarium, when they purchased it several years back, their goal was to rejuvenate this because it was prior owned by some other folks didn't do well and so they came in invested several million dollars into this incredible facility and and one of the mandates out of their headquarters out of texas was let's start a public diver program and so mm. happily because of our previous affiliation with the founders of that downtown aquarium who i knew quite well um we were contacted and we sat down with the powers to be and I'm happy to say uh, some 12 years later and 30,000 people later uh, we have now taken and exposed people to this immersion experience at the aquarium whether snorkeling in one of the cool exhibits with a lot of cool critters or scuba diving in one of four different exhibits and we can actually take that step three and do two their first two open water training dives at the downtown aquarium. So no driving, at least not much, great visibility, incredible critters. I, I always jokingly go into classes and say hello and thank you. And I always, how, how many of you are doing your open waters at the aquarium? And they'll raise their, their hand. I'll go, well, there is a downside. And you kind of get this grimace <laughs> on their face. I'll say, you're never going to see that many cool critters ever again up close. <laughs> so then they smile, of course. It is kind of true. You never will. So what a great way to begin an activity in sort of ideal circumstance, like going skiing on an indoor play, uh, indoor ski hills that they have around the country now and get started on the right ski or the right fin uh, correctly. And that's what we get to do. It's nice to have a safe, controlled environment where people can get a feel for it and like any other skill, scuba diving requires some experience for it to start to feel normal and natural and, and kind of automatic, and that's what you want. You want to know what to do. You know, you don't want to be surprised and not know what to do when you're diving. And what a neat thing to be able to do it at the aquarium. That's so cool. 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it is a great activity. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. I'm not the most fashionable guy out there, but I do know good style when I see it. And I do take pride in looking nice at work and uh, out on adventures. I want to look the part, um, but I don't want to be thinking about the gear all the time. And that's why I love Rourke. They've done the hard work for me. It's bold, bright, beautiful gear and clothing uh, that's adventure ready, but also work ready and office ready and, and kind of daily life ready. It's high-quality, long-lasting gear that will quickly become a regular part of your adventure kit. And what's cool about all Rourke's gear is it has a story behind it. They make the journey a part of the story of the product. The team at Rourke does a lot of traveling and adventures themselves, and they are inspired by what they see and what they do to make the quality clothing and gear that they sell. So whether that's remote island chains, the streets of Jakarta, kayaking sea trails in Maine, or anything in between, Rourke has developed the perfect options for those experiences. In fact, I'm wearing the Rourke Bless Up Breathable Stretch shirt right now, and I have yet to wear this thing and not get comments from other people about how good it looks, about how bright it is, and about how great it is. And by the way, my new podcasting bag is the Accomplice Mule 45 liter bag. It's like a travel bag, but it's perfect for all my podcasting gear and my mic stand and all that. I love it. And whenever I travel, which is often, I can I don't have to do anything. It's ready to go. So if you're looking to step up your gear and apparel game uh, for travel or adventure itself, or just looking good at work, but ready to adventure, as listeners of the show, you can get 15% off your first order going to Rourke.com and using the code ASP15. That's R-O-A-R-K.com, promo code ASP15 for 15% off your first purchase. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Here in Colorado, where I am, we have one of the largest number of divers per capita in the country. And I'm always asked, why? Why is that? And well, it's because of A1. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> it might be. I, I wish it were. <laughs> I, I have a lot of competitors and I have a lot of great competitors. So I can't, I, I sure wouldn't diss any of them by any stretch. I think it's Coloradans are adventuresome, outgoing people. They love to do indoor and outdoor activities. And, and with so much available to us here, uh, our aquarium and other things that I've mentioned, and, and the DIA, let's face it, you can get DIA, hopefully some way you can get there by public transit, and uh, you can get to wherever your destination is. You can head to the beach in a matter of hours in some cases and be scuba diving. So there's that's why we're so fortunate we have so many great opportunities here in Colorado. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, and in the wintertime, when the snow's not very good, which usually it is, but if the snow's not very good, then people like to have that alternate activity, especially when the winter starts to get long and they want to soak up some sun anyway. What better thing to do than to jump a plane for some beach somewhere and do some diving? Oh, I'll tell you, we all need a vitamin D hit every now and then, don't we? And oh, you're I right. do. Those short days in December just drive me bonkers. <laughs> <laughs> they get a little long. Those short days get long. Oh, man, they do, don't they? It's, uh, <laughs> how depressing is that? So, heck, you get a quick fix. Head down to Cozumel for four or five days. Get feeling pretty good about life again. Recharge. Come home and, and do whatever you do. And then go back again on another day. So, as you hear, it's not doesn't take much time to learn to dive. It's uh, I think it's affordable. We can sure talk about that. And then uh, you're off and diving, whether it's by yourself what a great family activity. My kids dive. I've got grandkids now, again, I'm old. Uh, I've got a couple of grandkids that I just started to introduce to diving. We took them to Cozumel here a few weeks ago. They had a blast. And wow, how, how cool is that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. We get a lot of friends. We, uh, it, it's kind of funny. We, we do a lot of group travel. We have a travel agency here at our store. And so we do, we do a, approximately a group trip a month. It averages out that way. And we go to, oh, from the Caribbean to the, to the other side of the world, to the South Pacific. And the friendships, here's people that have a common interest of an activity, find out that they're very similar in so many ways. And now they're sharing stories and fun and they're diving on the other side of the world together. Is that cool? Oh, I love it. 
You know, that's something that we often find out about adventure sports is they build a community too because people have a common interest. It's just a wonderful thing. I agree. So you're telling us about these great destinations, but you know, you got to take us a little bit farther than that. So tell us about an experience scuba diving that you just thought was amazing. Take us there so we can get a feel for what it's really like. All right. Well, people are always asking my wife and I, what's your favorite place? Where is your favorite place? And again, we've been quite blessed over the years and, and we, and there would be people to argue <laughs> with me. We love the Philippines. We have now been to the Philippines many times and there's a variety of reasons, and it's not all diving. One, it's the people. Uh, I love the people. You know what's cool? Uh, I, I digress. But what we've discovered is whether you go to uh, Cozumel or to the Bahamas or the Red Sea or Indonesia or wherever it might be, people are pretty darn cool. If you watch television, I won't pick on a station, but if you watch television, Unfortunately, I think we're led to believe differently. And so mm. when we get to these places, the smiles, the, the, the hugs, the friendliness, they're, we're tourists, we are spending our money. Yeah, they appreciate that. But the sincerity of it all, the simplicity. And so here we are in this country, and the people could not be more welcoming. And the Philippines, for Lynn and I, my wife and I, we have just been blown away by that. Then you go underwater on holy mackerel, and you, you think the Caribbean's cool, and it is, but all of a sudden, it, it almost night and day, the diversity from tiny little stuff, the weirdest stuff you've ever seen in your life, to big, big stuff like whale sharks. And I kind of like the big stuff. I like manta rays and whale sharks and sharks in general, and I think that's, for me, what I love. And there's one particular dive site uh, in the Philippines that we go to. And it's here's the crazy part. It's a snorkel dive. It's not even a scuba dive. But they, wow. the locals have discovered that the whale sharks like to come in. They eat krill, which is this tiny little teeny nothing critter, millions of them. And they hand feed the whale sharks. So they're sitting on this little cutout boat on the surface they have people on the boats, visitors who have come to see these. And then we jump in off our dive boats, get in and snorkel around. And so now there's, I'm not kidding, I've got a video clip of nine whale sharks in this area in one complete panoramic shot that was just mm. blown my mind. I'm within, I'm as close to that as I am my, my computer right now in front of me. So a matter of a couple of feet watching a vertically positioned whale shark 40 feet long being fed <laughs> by <laughs> krill. And, and, I mean, it's like a siphon. The, the water coming in their mouth is a horrific. You know, you don't want to get too close. I think you get sucked into their mouth. <laughs> but you're too tiny, like my wife's is little. Uh, it's that cool, and it's, it's magic. Here you are with one of God's greatest creatures there face-to-face, experiencing something that you read in a book or watch on a movie, but you're doing it. And, oh, yeah. I, you know, I could pontificate forever on those kinds of encounters, sea lion activity. We did uh, some great white shark diving in South Africa out of the Cape, cage diving several years ago. And unfortunately, again, I think that the sharks get such crap, pardon my language, but they get – so much harassment and bad press because of what we see on TV. And yet they're coming in, they're curious, they're looking at us and uh, yeah, you're in a cage and it's pretty sensational. I said, yes, they are feeding them to attract them. They are eating machines. And yet to be there within arm's reach of a 20, 25 foot great white, holy mackerel. I mean, how cool is that? That's amazing. You know, some people like to, to debate whether or not there's life on other planets and if aliens could ever make it to the Earth. And if they did, what would they look like? And I say, oh, they're here. I've seen them. <laughs> Put on your scuba gear. <laughs> Watch Star Wars and some of the others. If you were to sit there and, and look at the critters that or the creatures that they've developed and then go underwater, it's like, oh, that's where they got that one. I, I get it. You know, Avatar. Look at Avatar. So much diving stuff in Avatar, the creatures and the critters and, and so forth. They're taken from critters from underwater. 
That's, yeah. it, well, that's where they've gotten all these great ideas. Well, I just, one of my favorite things about scuba diving is here are all these animals that are, are made to, a, to adapt and survive in an environment that is so completely foreign to us mammals, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you go down in there and it's kind of like, wow, that just, it doesn't even look like anything you can relate to. No, it doesn't. And the sounds, I mean, you're, you're at peace underwater. And I won't, I, again, I don't want this to sound so tranquil that people are going, oh, God, yawn. Uh, it's not a yawner by any stretch. And uh, i take you to the Galapagos. Galapagos Islands, unbelievable. My wife calls it electronic diving. <laughs> it, it, is, it is fish on steroids. It is just big critters, whole bunch of them. Been there a few times, cooler water, but you've got the, the little sea lions who are so curious and in your face. And the more you horse around and do somersaults, the more excited they get, the more they dart around. Or you get the squadrons of hammerheads or Galapagos sharks or the whale sharks that I mentioned earlier. That's stuff that you only hear, and again, you hear about it, you read about it, you see it in a movie to go there. You can go there as a diver. And, and be on a boat 14 hours from the mainland in the sea doing your thing. I mean, how cool. I, I love that ability. You can see what Darwin saw back when, you know, back in the day, hundreds of years ago, and hit, see where he came up with his theory uh, of evolution, which happened there. Wow, it's a privilege. Hmm. Sounds like neat stuff. So you've traveled a lot. You've seen a lot of stuff. You've told us about amazing places to go, and that's enough to make people want to dive, whether they're divers, you know, if they're interested in the water or not. It's just the travel that would be fun. It is. It's. Uh, I don't know if getting there is any fun. You know, we've we've had to struggle through airline changes over the years, but I, I have decided that's just part of the deal. It's so worth it. You, you go to. You go to the airport, you get on the plane, and you, you sit down and watch a movie or read a book or two, and then you get there. And when, you, when they open the door and you feel that heat, the humidity, and you see the greenery and the people, it, you're into la-la land. And so you have this change that, that occurs. Everybody begins to smile. You can't help yourself but to smile. And then you frown. Everybody starts frowning the day they've got to go home. Then <laughs> they get on this darn cell phones <laughs> and start checking messages and emails and everything else. But it is, it's, the, it's a transformation, Kurt. It truly is. Well, Scott, I can tell by your enthusiasm that you love what you do and you're doing what you love. What's it like? Tell our listeners out there, what's it like to be able to make a career out of an adventure sport doing something you really enjoy? Oh man, it's uh, well. I'm lucky duck. There you go. I mean, to to be able to take professions that I've had in the past, military time. I did no nothing heroic. Served during the Vietnam era, though not in Vietnam happily. To be able to work with veterans I, through scuba. I, I'm a, a physical therapist. To be able to take my passion in working with people with disabilities, veterans put them underwater on scuba, the, the, the therapeutic opportunities, as I've already you know, talked about uh, for the, on the show, I am truly blessed. And I think that, and the recreational aspect of it in and of itself, to be able to take people, uh, normal folks from day to day who want to change in life or to, to put families together doing an activity that they can truly enjoy to travel, to learn about geography and, and uh, our world underwater to learn about critters to, to be able to talk about ecology uh, we do a lot of work with kids we take a lot of we have some inner city kid programs that we do where we do a try scuba diving experience uh, we've taken them to the aquarium for that we get uh, other schools that will come in and do either a try scuba or a week of diving here at the store I always tell these kids I hope one of you saves the world someday because in order to be a marine biologist or an aquarist or an oceanographer or an astronaut, you have to scuba dive. You have to be yeah, a scuba diver. Sure. And so the doors that diving can open from young to old, able-bodied and disabled, how, how great is that? I keep saying how cool is that, but it is cool. And, and so I am blessed. I do enjoy what I do. I always jokingly say, people say, when are you going to retire? And I said, well, 
I kind of do what people retire to do. So I'm, as long as the brain and the body work, I'm not in any hurry to get out of Dodge. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it. you You may have retired in 1984. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think you're right. <laughs> well, that's fun. So we, I love this question. I haven't asked it for a few shows here, but you got to tell us about a time that things didn't go right when you were diving and and how you got through it and advice that you might have for people that find themselves in a bizarre situation. Sure. And, and it relates to air management. You've sort of addressed it. <laughs> when you're underwater, you become so engrossed in what's taking place that oftentimes, and, and you become energized and excited, and that relates to breathing rate and air consumption. And unfortunately, you can only stay down so long. There's only so much air in that scuba cylinder. So I've, uh, unfortunately for me, found myself a couple of times, and I'm sorry, I, this is, I have to say this, I didn't practice what I preached. Uh-oh. So I've ran out of gas in the car a couple of times, too. So I, I wasn't monitoring my pressure gauge. One particular dive was in the Philippines. I saw, it was a night dive, and I saw, I saw stuff that I'd never seen before. And I'm filming with an underwater video camera thinking, well, this is National Geographic stuff. This is the best stuff ever. I should be on TV <laughs> for all this. <laughs> and I, I'm seeing octopus that are fees, feeding and blue-ringed octopus and smoking coral. And it just went on and on and on. And all of a sudden, I looked up, and I didn't see anybody. <laughs> My wife had finally – she had actually told me a few minutes before that she was going to take off and head back toward the boat. I went, go ahead. I'm filming. I'm I'm going for it. All of a sudden, nobody around. So I started swimming towards shallower water, and I could see some dive lights. And I thought, okay, cool. And I got over close to the uh, other divers, and another thing appeared underwater. And I'm just blown away by this magic that's happening. And uh, suddenly, there's nobody, no divers around. And I took a breath, and you don't abruptly run out of air. That's the good thing. Right. Uh, as you probably discovered, there's a warning. It's like the engine starts to sputter. Well, you know, you start to breathe and it, you have to draw a little bit harder and a little bit harder. That's the warning that, row, row, you're, you're low on air. And so I, thought, oh, I looked at my gauge and, yep, I was down to nothing. So I didn't panic. I got anxious and I began my ascent. And we talk about ascending and not going too rapidly. I probably went a little faster than I should. <laughs> to my good fortune, there she was, my wife of 45 years, hovering underwater. And I came up behind her. I, I spun her around. <laughs> and uh, I caught heck for this one. Spun her around, grabbed her alternate air source, put it in my mouth, and I was able to breathe safely and and do what we call a safety stop so i was then uh, then we ascended to the surface i say that because it was a recent story from last year and my wife doesn't forget those things so i have been reminded on multiple occasions and she bailed me out again there <laughs> for helping me so you know not mon it's hard to to run it, it's hard to run into trouble if you're if you're prudent if you follow the rules and watch the equipment, you know, don't exceed your experience level, but it's easy to get mesmerized by all this stuff too. And then air consumption is probably the, I'd say one of the more uh, often occurring problems that if people don't monitor their gauge, their gas gauge. Yeah. But the good news is you hopefully have a buddy close by. You've learned how to share air with that buddy and you can safely uh, make that ascent to the surface. So here I am, safely have having safely ascended. <laughs> you know, and if you had to skip your safety stop and go onto the surface, odds are everything would have been fine. Yeah, I, I didn't exceed my bottom time, we call it. So I was within l- my limits of not exceeding the time I should have spent underwater. I was just so engrossed in my breathing rate, I know, was exceeded my normal breathing rate just by virtue this feeding octopus that you can't even imagine i shot every angle imaginable and i <laughs> here to there and everywhere and i'm I, I was pretty excited by that so i i was within those limits so i i'm i didn't have to suffer uh, decompression illness 
Yeah. So was- well, for our listeners, I'm going to just do a real quick review of that stuff. Scuba diving within limits is is a very safe, enjoyable activity. The, the dangers are if you went too deep for too long, but Scott, you know this, with an 80 cubic foot tank, unless you're a really aggressive diver, it's actually difficult to exceed those limits before you run out of air. Yeah, it is. And, and you learn about those things during a, a class. So you read about it, you learn about time and depth, bottom time, you learn about uh, why you don't exceed those limits. You learn about things called the bends. Uh, we hate talk about scary things, but you have to talk about those things because oh, yeah. by knowing it, you can prevent it and avoid it. And, you know, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee you won't get injured in a car unless you don't get in a car. Uh, we always jokingly say there's only two guarantees where you couldn't get the bends. Uh, don't don't dive. You can't get the bends if you don't dive. Or don't come up. <laughs> <It's a pretty laughs> yeah. Stay in you and yet, if you stay within the safety parameters, it, it's minuscule. It's not impossible. Uh, it is possible, but it's not quite very likely. So that relates back to those what-if drills that we go through in the learning process. Well, and what it's really about is dissolved gases that are in the fluids of your body. And if you came up too fast and those dissolved gases could come out of solution, but that's why we have the limits. That's why you do a safety stop even. That's exactly. just in case any tiny little micro bubbles are starting to form. They have a chance to, to dissipate, and it just dissipates through your lungs as you breathe. It's all very natural, painless stuff, right? So that's the yes. first one is you don't want to go too deep for too long, but it's hard to do that with sport gear. It, it is. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. The second one is don't hold your breath. (laughs) Right? Yeah, that's a biggie. That's actually the number one rule in scuba diving. Breathe continuously and not hold your breath. And, And of course, the result is if you were to fill your flexible lungs with air at depth, hold your breath and begin to ascend, because of reduced pressure, the air in the lungs now expands. And if you weren't to, if you were not to exhale, that expanding air could overexpand and, you know, fill in the blank. Not, doesn't happen, hardly ever, could happen. And that's why we drill people on always breathing. We even uh, one of the exercises learned in the pool and repeated in the open water is to remove and replace clearing your regulator while underwater. And one of the things that we emphasize as a, as a motor movement is take a big breath, take your regulator, second mouthpiece out of your mouth, and whenever it's out of your mouth, you blow little bubbles. And the instructors know that if the student is not doing that, you tap them on the mouth, doesn't mean you want to kiss underwater. Well, I just could, but <laughs> in this case it doesn't. And so you tap them on the mouth and, and remind people to blow bubbles. So we are re- doing enough of those repeated skills in the pool and, again, in the open water that I think it becomes second nature. Yeah, and, and that's what's important. And if you remember those two things, boy, there are other things that you learn in the class that are very valuable, but those are the really the, the two big dangers right there. I think so. We again I mentioned ecology and the environment. We we spend a great deal of time encouraging people to not touch things, don't grab things, don't harass uh, the critters, stay off the bottom, don't bump into the to the coral because coral is a live animal. And every time you accidentally or intentionally bump into these things, you you damage the reef. So we're trying to emphasize through diving and through teaching diving how to properly encounter the critters you know it's like you go up to the mountains and you see the bear well you don't jump out of the car and run over to the bear and harass the bear because the bears may do something defensive and that happens underwater if you harass something underwater the chances are you could get bit or stung or scraped but it's it's a defensive mechanism the oh, yeah. animals underwater don't they just don't attack that's not what happens you know, I was in Penning Camp, Florida, and I was trying to take a picture, and I was slightly buoyant, and I did the stupid thing. I put one finger under a little piece of coral to stabilize myself. I should not have done that. It was, it was a bad wrong. But a week later, the skin fell off my finger. 
Oh. <laughs> it was fire coral. Nader, nader. <laughs> I said, all right, now Surf I know. You're right. <laughs> don't, don't touch, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry to say I've done the same thing. You know, people, <laughs> years ago, we used to, we used to wear gloves, uh, diving gloves or some sort of glove. That was the big thing. And, oh, boy, I, I wore them, too. And then what happened is you felt bulletproof right. underwater. And, oh, I've got a glove on. I'm going to go touch and grab and, and feel for this feel this item underwater. Well, guess what? That you, you just damaged or maybe killed that something. So, as you already pointed out, now we're bare-fingered. And, and we try to be very conscientious and cautious then we don't oh, get yeah. hurt well i tell you what floating around or through the chasms of coral reef with every color of the rainbow you know in the coral all the different shapes they're just so alien and new to us the different types of fish every shape size color imaginable and then all the creatures that you can't even identify what is that you know, I know. that it's is awesome. just what a great what a great encounter. Man, oh, how cool it, it, is that? It, it's pretty cool. And little and big at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a, it, it, the reef's changed. I mean, global warming, I'm not a scientist, so I'm not here to state it as a fact. But through pollution and, and other overfishing, we can't deny that, uh, there, there's there been a, a decrease. I'm sorry to say that I, I don't see the quantities of fish in the Caribbean, the Bahamas, that I did back in the day, it doesn't seem like. the. Uh, unfortunately, there has been a tremendous amount of fishing, and that's too bad because now some of the cool critters I once saw in volumes, you know, tons of them, uh, we don't see to this day. And, and I think that's where the South Pacific comes in. We, When we go to Indonesia and, and Micronesia even, and uh, the Philippines, it's different. The South Pacific happily still has a, a plethora of, of critters out there. But, you know, some of it is our own doing, unfortunately. You know, you talk, talk about ecology, the shark finning, the, the disgusting, pathetic habit of, of cutting off shark fins for shark fin soup and then throwing carcasses underwater. I know, it's gross. Sorry, folks. Um, you know, those are the things we're trying to educate people. Don't do that and, and shame on them for doing it. Maybe a shark today, from a tourism standpoint, is worth thousands of dollars for people to see the live shark as opposed to the fins in a bowl of soup. And the soup, I am told, I've never tasted it, never will, uh, has no taste. They have to add mm. stuff uh, to, <laughs> to, to make it, to give it flavor. Isn't that crazy? So it's going to taste like tomatoes and onions and paprika, maybe. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It, it's just <laughs> pathetic, though, when you think about it. So uh, I think the divers, we are sort of the ambassadors to the underwater world. So we can go out and through our activity, through what we witnessed and experienced, we can go tell people, go do it. It's fun. It's enjoyable for all the reasons we talked about. And and let's let's be careful out there. Let's take care of those reefs and those critters so that our grandchildren and great grandchildren can can also see them, and it doesn't. I'm not trying to sound heroic here. I'm just trying to sound use your common sense, and we can do that. I think we have that ability to do just that. Oh yeah, well, I I don't think I could have said it better. I I've said this often before, but I think the best way to get people aware of taking care of this wonderful planet we live on is by getting them out into nature, so that they they become familiar with it and appreciate it and understand how fragile it is and how the ecosystems interrelate and, you know, the symbiotic relationships and how all of these things have to come together for this beautiful, beautiful blue marble that we all, you know, call home. It's getting people involved on that level that makes people understand and want to take care of it. Agreed. But if you could see me now, I've got two thumbs up. I mean, I, yeah, right on. So everyone ought to scuba dive. And the reason is... The whole world should scuba dive, yes. Absolutely. The water <laughs> is a lifeblood of this planet. And when you understand that and, and you're a part of it, what a difference that makes. Oh, man. And when we before the show, you and I were talking, and I, I've sort of coined my own phrase. I, I call water the great equalizer. And it doesn't matter how tall or short, 
your gender, uh, your ability or your disability, water is magical. And from a diver's perspective, it truly is the great equalizer. I love that, that aspect of what it provides. Yeah, and I'd like to throw out there too, some people are uncomfortable in water because they never learned to swim very well and they, they've had to fight to keep their head up and they don't like the idea of holding their breath and all of those things go away when you have scuba equipment. You know, it's true. We've had a number of people, uh, well, again, are, are people with disabilities who they weren't great swimmers before they became disabled. And now they're going to go in the water on scuba as someone with limited mobility and, and this epiphany of, holy moly, I, look what I just did. I was free. I actually moved underwater. And I think it, it relates to good equipment and, and good instruction. And both exist today. And it's, it's across the world, the training yeah. organizations and all of them. I, I have to give tip my hat to all of them. They do a really good job. It's methodical. It's logical. It's, uh, it's not rocket science by any stretch. And so I, I, it lets people experience this activity in a pretty succinct manner. Oh, that's great. Well, Scott, we could go on for another two hours and God, we need we to get could. together love, sometime and do that. I hate talking about this, Kurt. <laughs> I can tell. Hey, can I give you the greatest experience? Yes, please. I got to give you just one last one. Okay. If I could, I, I just wrote it down. Um, this year uh, in October, and the Arizona, the USS Arizona, it relates to that. Uh, Pearl Harbor, the USS Arizona will have been commissioned. 100 years ago this October. Wow. I want to see the 17th, but I, I, sorry folks, that might be wrong. And then on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day, this year will be the uh, 75th anniversary. So 100th year from the commissioning, 75th year uh, since the attack on Pearl Harbor. We have a very close relationship with the National Park Service. And in particular, there's a dive team for the NPS. This is our 100 year anniversary. This year, they're celebrating their uh, birthday this year. One of the uh, primary people involved with the dive team uh, invited last year my wife and I to join them on a, on a dive uh, expedition of the USS Arizona. And I mean, it's still, I still have to pinch myself <laughs> to think that we actually got a chance to do this. And so we were, we had been to the memorial before. And if, folks, if you haven't, you got to go. It's it's the most emotional thing I think anybody could ever do. Mm. Um, we got to go out to the Arizona four different days in a row and help set up for a, a, an underwater filming project that they were doing. And, and I have to tell you, to go underwater, it's not a beautiful wreck, and it's not meant to, I don't want to suggest it would be a beautiful wreck, mm. but knowing what it symbolizes and knowing what took place underwater um, it, it's just an amazing feeling and to know that there are so many souls and, and left underwater from these these people who, who sacrificed their lives on our behalf is pretty emotional. And to see some of the artifacts that are still left on that wreck was, I don't know, amazing experience for me. So when anybody asks me, what's your best one? Give me your best one. What's the best one that ever happened? That's it. Did it last year. And I feel blessed and privilege to have done it. You know what? We should have you back on. You know why? Because we haven't talked about advanced certifications. We haven't talked about wreck diving. We haven't talked about cave diving. We haven't talked about a <laughs> lot of things that scuba can lead to. So we'll, we'll have to have another show sometime, Scott, where we can get into some of those details. I would appreciate it. And, and I, I really thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about scuba. For those of you that are divers, you've been nodding your head through a whole bunch of this. At least I hope you have been. I hope you haven't been shaking your head back and forth. <laughs> and if you haven't, wherever you are, uh, check it out. Uh, go do a Discover Scuba Diving experience at your local dive center. Try it out. See what it feels like. And, and uh, hopefully you'll you'll start nodding your head and you'll agree with everything that I've just said. It's a wonderful activity. It's a great experience, whether as I've you know, family or not, uh, do it. Uh, give it a whirl. And I think you can. you'll discover just how much fun this really is. Oh, yeah, no doubt about it. And you can always get a hold of Scott at a1scuba.com. That's a1scuba.com, and they have a travel agency there. They have certification programs. They have a store that's full of all kinds of wonderful things. So 
A1Scuba.com is, is where you can find Scott and learn more about all this. Thanks. Thank you, Kurt. Been a blast. Been a blast. <laughs> oh, it's a lot of fun. And thanks for your time today. And for all of our listeners out there, you know, I say it every show, but I mean it. Get out there and have some fun because it might just change your life. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. <laughs>